I have grown to love the country. I've grown to love the people. They're very straight. They tell you how, how it is, but they tell it to you in a way that you have to read between the lines. So I have learned how to read between lines much more. Uh, they don't have hierarchies. There is a great appreciation for people's time. Um, so you, leave, you, you lead a full life on weekdays. So you have, um, my day starts at six when I have to get my kids out of home to go to school. And I'm in the office by about 8.30. I don't come back before 7, 7.30. But there's very little slack time in those hours. Um, uh, we, we have weekends which are beautifully ours. But if work has to be delivered, it doesn't matter when it needs to be delivered. I mean, that's also the philosophy a little bit. Um, what I love about the, of working in Switzerland is there's a humility about the Swiss. They're very smart, but there is a beautiful way that we have been able to take the ideas and spread them out globally. There is a deep cultural sensitivity. I've never felt I'm an Indian and how do I fit in? Uh, they will value the ideas you bring to the table. That I was just talking uh, with a colleague about my days for American Express, I still remember so fondly. It was like a family and it, they were always there for you. No matter what was going on in your life, people were there, maybe even too incestuous sometimes because people are so warm and so involved. Um, but I think for sure that whole sense of team, that sense of collaboration, that sense of being there, having your back, is something that I would love to see more. But that comes to us naturally. By the same token, I mean, I think there would be a balance uh, because uh, there's also deep rivalry sometimes and competitiveness that comes within the Indian workplace. And in a way, in Switzerland, it doesn't matter whether you're the CEO or you are the richest person living in Basel, you all take public transport. So there is a, there is a stabilizing or let's say a leveling that happens so the warmth I would take from here, but I would bring the leveling back um, to, to not make the difference. I'll take that in two parts. The first one, I probably, yes, I represent a generation that is not there very much. I've had, I'm in my third company in 30 years. Um, but I, what, I did, what I think really has held me in good stead is I have reinvented myself in different jobs within the same company. So I believe building that credibility, but I'm still, I look for the challenge. I look for the challenge as much as someone else, uh, but I see no reason to leave if I can build both depth and breadth uh, within the organization. I love the fact that organizations allow you to move cross-functionally or be able to do different things within your own role that enrich your development and your growth. Uh, for the younger generation, or the millennials, I think they're looking for similar things. They probably don't find it. I believe that over the last 20 years, uh, at least that I have worked overseas, I think we've become so confounded with the pace of change, um, the the cycles that, the economic cycles that have taken, you know, huge hits, like banking took a huge hit post 9-11 or the recession in, in 2008 and the stock market crash. Most, at least multinationals, have had it pretty tough in trying to focus on the HR side. I think the third part I would say, HR is pretty archaic still in some respects. We still hang on to an archaic performance management system that no longer serves the purpose that it used to serve. I think people are looking, our technology uptake has been slow in many respects. While we all like to say we've done it, mm -hmm. but the, if you dig a little bit below the surface, even getting basic data right is sometimes a challenge. And not just for smaller companies, but even for the global companies. So the, the newer generation, or the millennials as we speak of them, 
I don't think it's just unique to them. I think even some of the Gen X are looking for experiences. They realize career ladders are no longer conventional. They realize the next move is not going to come as easy. So talent management and really focusing on getting you the right experience to continue helping you develop and be successful. If we don't get that right, people will move because with the illusion that someone else is going to give it to them. Um, hopefully, uh, some of us will start getting this right, but it hasn't been an easy journey for us, I think. I'm very proud of my cross-functional experience because I think it keeps me real. And I don't mean it disrespectfully to HR colleagues, but I do believe being out there in the field with line managers, working, having been burnt and learnt it yourself, gives you a, a different perspective. For me, it's given me uh, a focus on how to be simple, on how to take my messages and translate them, to really kill processes that are uh, not adding value, to constantly challenge status quo. It also gives me the possibility to ask questions that people may be scared to ask. So I may be the person at the table who asks a question that everybody else is thinking about but might not. Um, so I absolutely believe that even if you are um, in HR, the ones that I see are more successful are the ones who've really gone and immersed themselves in the business in, in from being a true partner. I think it's a combination of both, I would say. Um, technology has created this space and giving you information at your doorstep. We, you know, we all say, I researched it or I googled it. Um, you don't know something, you go and you check a few keywords and you can, you know, within a few minutes, you can be a little bit of a master in, in at least being able to go out and speak some blah, blah about it. Um, but combined with that, I think where I see learning there's a lot of focus now of what is, we used to have glorious development programs where you went to a beautiful hotel and you spent time, it was seen more as a reward, it was seen as uh, some way of motivating people saying that, oh, you are somebody important, let's, let's get you out into a good learning program. I think those days are gone. I think companies are being more deliberate about how we want to spend the dollars for the kind of learning we do. On the other hand, some of the problems remain the same. You're still trying to get leadership behavior to change, but you are now adjusting to different leadership behaviors. In fact, it's you're dealing with mass leaders. How do you drive impact across mass leaders? So it's what I see, there's a convergence of uh, actual classroom and virtual training with things like social proof, if someone else can do it, why can't you do it? So you're deploying technology in a very smart way to drive the behavior change you want to be able to achieve. The other thing that I've seen, at least in learning programs, is you've got to make it available uh, because you all, we all learn differently. It has to be available and accessible at any point. You can't determine what schedule and pace I learn at. But if you don't provide it, you'll have too many complaints about the fact that it's not available. Uh, I think the last thing that I think where learning is coming back, and I see it more and more, is not just doing learning for learning's sake, but really trying to build this and, and merge this with some way of giving back to society. So we see a lot of our learning programs now having an action-oriented phase where we, the, the knowledge we have acquired can be then given to somebody else in an underdeveloped country or a project where we pro bono uh, really try and experiment with that knowledge. Yeah. I think in any case it's very tough um, to manage. If you think about the conventional years and what we talked about it was easier to think about how we're going to have, we'll have a few Chinese and we'll have a few Thai and we'll have a few Indians, we'll get the Europeans in and we'll have the Americans. Um, now it's, it's virtual. It is uh, every day you're on a Skype call 
where you've got to be inclusive in the way you deal with people. You've got to be sensitive to the fact that people will speak up. Some cultures will not speak up. You've got to be able to actually you know, deliver your content in multiple languages, multiple medias, multiple works councils, employee representatives, unions. It is huge and the pace of doing that is massive. We have 32 languages in which we deliver content. Every time I think about an announcement and how we're going to translate, at least a minimum of about eight languages, which is the minimum we need to go with. And then it has nuance of how is this going to be received. I'll give you an anecdotally. So our CEO came up with this word of unboss. And just translating that word culturally, it's part of our culture aspiration. It has been a challenge. But I think people have loved it once you make that effort to make it real for them. So there is a huge focus on, on inclusion. There's a huge focus on the behaviors that require that inclusion. It's, there's huge focus on the different ethnic diversities that you may have or uh, you know, just for LGBTI, for example, is a big topic for us. Female versus male remains a big topic for us. So I think it's far beyond just geography. It comes in every direction. To be more inclusive in the way you communicate, the way you, not just communicate actually, I would even go one step back. I'd say that right from the inception, how do you involve at the time of creation um, the, your ideas? So crowdsourcing is a big topic because that's the best way we can get people to speak up. And then take that through more focused groups to really try and make sure that you, people's voices have been heard to finally launch something. The willingness and ability to learn um, and adapt your behavior still is extremely crucial. There has to be a certain degree of humility that you're never going to have the answers. Um, and I think I will always think about learning on a daily basis. And I think we all do. It, the knowledge comes from everywhere. It can come from anyone. And you have to be able to keep yourself open to those influences that come to you. Um, Formal upskilling versus casual upskilling versus how I do it, I think has become very blurred uh, because people learn on the go. Um, and it's going to still be very much focused on bite-sized concept but deeply embracing practice and experience. Because if you don't experience it, there's no way that you're going to try and figure out, you know, the next time you come to a situation, we, we have a lovely phrase which we use, what will you do when you, you know, if you don't know what to do? And a lot of situations that we are facing, we have never seen before. Um, so most of us are learning by doing, even when we've never done it before. I think that's, for me, the critical skill to have, to keep be open to being able to do that. I think the aptitude, all of us have it at some level or the other, otherwise you wouldn't be in the organization. That's your ticket to ride, that's your entry point. But the attitude is going to get you, no matter what, because very more and more, um, the ripple effect of negative behaviors tend to catch up much faster. Uh, the organizations, I still think, take too long to react to actually take some action, but you feel it with colleagues, you feel it with direct reports, you feel it with peers. When you see behaviors that are unintended or have negative consequences, uh, the backlash is pretty strong, even though they may never tell you that it's happening and maybe it takes too much time. But at the end of it, no matter what we do, let's say our tasks will be taken over by more autom automated processes or more machine learning, putting, holding it together is still going to be done by human beings. At least I think in the next 20, 30 years, God knows what happens after that. And to have that humility, to be able to really take people forward with you and along with you is going to be key. And for me, then attitude far outstrips 
any aptitude you have.